And so I want you to remember that unless you're using long read sequencing technologies, generally speaking, the, the reads that you get from an RNA-seq experiment are short. And so you need to map them back to either the genome or some other kind of reference database in order to figure out which gene or which transcripts uh, a particular read came from. So I mentioned on the previous slides that one of the steps of the RNA-seq protocol is to map reads from an RNA-seq experiment to the genome or transcriptome in order to identify where the uh, transcript came from. And so there's a few ways to approach this mapping task. So the first approach is basically just uh, to avoid mapping at all and just do what's called de novo assembly. And so this is analogous to the genome whole genome assembly approach we talked about previously, where the idea is you take your shorter long reads from your RNA-seq experiment, and you basically just try to rebuild the original transcripts uh, that the reads came from. And so uh, similar to the uh, whole genome assembly problem, this approach essentially relies on very high coverage of all the transcripts uh, that you're trying to rebuild. And so typically in practice, you can only really build the highly expressed genes because those are the gene, those are the transcripts for which you have enough coverage of your transcript in order to uh, really build your, identify your contigs and rebuild your original transcript. In contrast, most of the poorly and even moderately expressed genes uh, don't have high enough coverage across the entire transcript in order to rebuild the entire transcript. And so basically, although the advantage of de novo assembly is that you don't need a reference genome to map reads to, uh, to the transcripts, uh, the primary disadvantage is that you can only really rebuild highly expressed genes uh, from the reads. And even if you use long read sequencing, part of the problem is that, uh, yeah, your long reads avoid a lot of the assembly problems that you would have with short reads. But typically you have, uh, typically you're able to sequence fewer transcripts when you use long read sequencing. And so you still may miss a lot of the transcripts that are poorly expressed. The second approach you can use is to basically just take reads and map them back to a reference genome. And so here <clears throat> you might just, yeah, take each read and align them to the genome and hope that most of the reads align uniquely to the genome. And so the main challenge you have with mapping reads back to the genome is that reads that map entirely to, for example, one exon may be alignable, but the bigger problem are the reads that span splice junctions. Because the problem is that uh, the, read, the, the alignments of splice junction reads back to the genome, the, the true alignments anyways, will involve large gaps because for those reads that span splice junctions, Part of the read will map to the three prime end of one exon, and the other part will map will map to the five prime end of another exon. And because exons are separated by potentially large introns, then those gaps are going to penalize the alignment very heavily. And therefore, in practice, it would be impossible to find those kind of uh, gapped alignments essentially. And so, mapping back to the original genome essentially involves. Uh, basically missing a lot of alignments of splice reads, unless you do something about this. And so in practice, a uh, third strategy is typically used, which is basically to map reads to a transcriptome database <clears throat> or a splice junction database. And so the general idea is that for most genomes, you, for you know, many of the model organisms anyways, you typically know where most of the, for example, protein coding genes are. And so you typically also might know what the general intron and exon structure of most of those genes are. And so the idea is that either theoretically or using previously collected data, the idea is you take your genome sequence and you build possible isoforms out of those genes. And so the two ways of doing this are either theoretically or observed. And so the theoretic transcriptome databases basically just says, okay, well, if I know where all the exons are, then I can build all possible hypothetical transcripts uh, that you could make by combining all of the exons in all the different ways that they can be combined. Um, and then basically I'll just make a huge 
database of possible transcriptomes. And then now when I have a new RNA-seq experiment, I can take the reads, I can just map them against all of the possible isoforms, uh, and you know I can be fairly certain that I'll cover most of the possible isoforms that are being generated. Uh, in contrast, the observed approach just says, okay, well, maybe in the particular tissue or cell type, type that I'm looking at, maybe someone has already done really deep uh, RNA sequencing of those, of those tissues or cell types. And so I'll just look at what transcripts other people have previously identified. And I'm just going to build a database out of isoforms that I know have been sequenced already. And so the advantage of the theoretic transcriptome-based approach is that you don't need to rely on someone having done deep RNA sequencing of your tissue or cell types before. Um, furthermore, even if someone has done RNA seq experiments before on your on your sample of interest, uh, they may not have been able to uh, to characterize all the different isoforms uh, that were expressed. So if they were using like short read sequencing, uh, it would be really hard to actually identify which isoforms you're reads came from, uh, the best you can do is pretty much just identify which splice junctions or exons uh, an individual read map to. Um, so yeah, so the nice thing about theoretic-based transcriptomes is that uh, you can be sure that you can build a pretty comprehensive database of all possible isoforms, and you don't need to rely on other people's data. Uh, the advantage of the observed transcriptomes is that your transcriptome databases tend to be a lot smaller. And this is an advantage because if you have a read that, uh, if you're building a database of theoretic transcriptomes, for example, uh, there's going to be a lot of sharing of splice junctions or exons between different isoforms. And that's a problem because if you have a read that came from a single splice junction of say exons one and two, um, in theory, there could be a lot of isoforms that have exons 1 and 2 spliced together. And so therefore, when you map your read to your theoretic transcriptome database, then you'll have a lot of multi-mapping reads because there's a lot of possible isoforms that have exon 1 and 2 spliced together. Uh, but if you only look at observed transcriptomes, for example, maybe previously people have found that exons 1 and 2 only get spliced together in one particular isoform and all the other ones that all the other possible isoforms that could be made were not actually made and so uh, your observed data already tells you that you could ignore the other possibilities and so basically because the observed transcriptome database is much smaller uh, multi-mapping reads will probably be less of a problem but the disadvantage of the observed transcriptome database is that uh, you might miss novel splicing events that uh, that weren't previously seen in other data, right? And so uh, basically, yeah, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both the theoretic and observed approaches. And so it's uh, both of these approaches are used in practice. The only thing I want to say about splice junction databases is that, uh, like I just mentioned a few minutes ago, um, whether you use a theoretic or observed transcriptome database, if you are using short read sequencing where the reads are much shorter than the transcript length, then in practice, it's pretty much impossible to uh, quantify isoform level expression measurements uh, because isoforms are very long. And so because the reads are so short with short read sequencing, it's uh, generally speaking, it's there, there can be many isoforms that a given read maps to. And so multi-mapping basically prevents you from assigning expression to whole isoforms. So in that case, oftentimes people actually don't map to databases of whole isoforms. They map to databases of splice junctions where different either theoretic or observed uh, pairs or triplets of exons that get spliced together are used to map reads to.